Okay, so having talked a little bit about the history of IQ testing and how we interpret the scores and how we can determine if a test is good or not, one of the other questions that we need to know about IQ tests is, so what? You know, what can we determine about a person or what can we predict once we know a person's score on an IQ test? Now, if you remember back to Alfred Binet, I said that he had designed the first test as a way to predict which kids had the highest uh, likelihood of succeeding in school. And modern IQ tests, almost all of them are derivatives of his test, so it shouldn't surprise anybody that they are very, very good at predicting educational outcomes. Generally speaking, kids with higher IQs, they tend to get higher grades, they tend to have higher SAT scores, all that sort of thing. IQ scores are okay at predicting job success. A lot here depends on how you're defining job success. What it will define is, or what it will predict, excuse me, is things like who's going to get into graduate school. So if you have, say, two people who both want to be lawyers, one has a very high IQ, one has a lower IQ, Generally speaking, the high IQ person is more likely to do well on test scores and to get into law school. But if we have a bunch of really bright people who've now all graduated law school, within that group, some of them are still going to be higher IQ than others, but IQ is not necessarily going to be a good predictor of who turns out to be a really successful lawyer versus just a so-so lawyer because now you're going to start also getting into all these other variables like their personality, their motivation, their work ethic, all of these things that have nothing to do with IQ but that will determine how far they go in their careers. So IQ tests are a little bit related to job success but nowhere near as strongly as they relate to educational outcomes. IQ tests do not predict um, how personality, they don't predict how happy you're going to be, are you going to have decent social skills. A lot of people tend to have the stereotype of the high IQ nerd with no social skills whatsoever. And absolutely there are some people who fit that stereotype, but let's face it, there are some people who are not very smart who also have completely loser social skills. And it goes both ways. There are high IQ people with wonderful social skills, lower IQ people who also have wonderful social skills. There's not a, a, a strong correlation at all between the two. So there is a lot of debate when you look at public policy and how people think about, particularly about education, there is a lot of debate about the pros and cons of using IQ tests and what should we do with these tests test scores once we have them. The big advantage is that you can use them to place kids in an appropriate educational setting. Uh, maybe you have a kid who is incredibly bright and the test can help let the school know that really this kid needs to be in a more advanced class so that he can get the challenge that he requires and that could be important information. Maybe you have a kid who isn't doing well in school and everyone's ready to write him off and they think he has low IQ. You give him an IQ test and you say, nope, actually he's really bright. He's just got dyslexia or ADHD. So now that kid can get the help that he needs. So the advantage here is that it can help place people um, so that they aren't either bored or in a class that's too difficult for them. On the other hand, sometimes people put way too much emphasis on the number. You know, they go nuts, oh, your kid has an IQ of 105, my kid has an IQ of 106. When you're talking small differences like that, in practical terms, they're identical. Uh, at the place I used to work with gifted and talented kids, the highest score you can get on one of the IQ tests is 160 plus. So if you go back and look at that bell curve, that is way above average. It's not even on the chart that I showed you. But parents would go nuts. Well, how much higher is he? Is his IQ 160, 180, 190? And we'd say, look, at this point, it really doesn't matter. Your kid is just so bright that the number is insane. But they would go nuts obsessing over the number. Um, and when you look at placing children in educational settings, 
there are schools and school districts that will set these arbitrary cutoffs, not allow any room for judgment calls, not allow for the fact that IQ doesn't change much day to day, but it might fluctuate a point or two here or there based on if the kid is tired or has a headache or in a bad mood that day or whatever. The results of a test can become a self-fulfilling prophecy, and this can be either a good thing or a bad thing. So the bad way is someone gets a low IQ score and says, oh, I'm dumb, I might as well stop trying. Or they get a really high IQ score and they say, oh, well, that means everything should come really easy to me. If it doesn't, I'm just going to give up. So that's a bad thing. But it can also go the other way. You know, a kid can get a high IQ and say, wow, you know, maybe I thought I was not that bright, but I'm a lot brighter. And now they think they're capable of more, so they try more, and now they do, in fact, accomplish more. Uh, and I used to see this when we would get kids that turned out to be very, very bright. They had very high IQs, but also had either ADHD or a learning disability. And a lot of these kids were so happy. They would say, oh my gosh, I thought I was stupid. And now you're telling me, okay, I've got this other problem, but I'm not an idiot. And they were so relieved, and now they would try harder in school because they knew that they weren't, you know, that they had this high IQ. So this can be a double-edged sword, the self-fulfilling prophecy. Another issue with intelligence tests is that they may be biased against people who are not part of the white majority culture. You know, I'd given the example of bias before if you gave an English test to a kid who doesn't know English. You know, well, that's a, an obvious example. Here, that's not the issue, but you may have issues like, let's say you're testing an African-American child and the tester is white and now the kid feels a little bit intimidated or is a little bit shyer and therefore a little bit more hesitant to answer questions. Even though that child's not deliberately throwing the test and the tester is not deliberately doing anything wrong, but it still might lead to a subtle change in the, in the dynamic, and the end result is you may wind up underestimating this child's IQ. Um, or even just the structure of the test, where I ask the kid questions and the kid has to answer them correctly. Well, in white majority culture, parents do that with their kids all the time. They answer questions, and the kid knows that the parent knows the answer, but that they're testing the child. But in other cultures, kids are taught from a very young age not to show off in front of adults. And so that child in this situation may pretend not to know answers that they really do know because they don't want it to look like they're bragging or showing off. And so again, you might wind up underestimating that child's intelligence. So there have been some attempts over the years to develop what are called culture fair tests. Uh, where the impact of culture is minimized. Other people have said maybe you should call them culture reduced, that you can lower the level of bias, but maybe not ever get rid of it completely. These tests are not used very much, uh, just because, in my opinion, they're a wonderful idea in theory, but so far no one's been able to develop really good ones that will be statistically reliable and that will turn out to be valid predictors of future behavior. So it's an interesting topic um, and people are continuing to work on it, but you don't see these tests used very much at the moment. One of the last things I want to adjust in this chapter is the idea of intelligence. Is it nature or nurture? Okay, because that's one of the questions that people ask a lot is how much of your intelligence is genetic? And the answer is that overall, research shows that intelligence does have a strong genetic component, anywhere from about 40 to 60 percent, depending on what study you look at. Um, excuse me, 50 to 75. I read my notes wrong. But the catch here is that heritability estimates they refer to a population. They don't refer to any one person. So even if, you know, for the sake of argument, let's say heritability was 75%, it doesn't mean we can point to any one person and say, oh, I, you know, your IQ was 75% genetic. It is entirely possible that for one person, genetics played a much stronger role, and for another person, the environment played a much stronger role. 
Okay, so some examples of environmental influences would be the kinds of learning experiences you get. You know, do parents read to a child? Do they talk to them? Does the child have a chance to just explore their world and try different things? And remember from an earlier class, this doesn't have to include a lot of expensive toys. You know, this can be, does the kid get to play with pieces of cloth that have different textures? Do they get the chance to stack Tupperware containers and knock them over again? And they learn about gravity and physics and size and shape. That can be the exploration, but that's still very different than, say, the kid who spends most of his time sitting in front of the TV, not doing anything requiring active thought. And then we can also look at biological influences other than genetics. So if a person suffers brain damage, if they um, are malnourished, if they're exposed to drugs in the womb, that sort of thing. So last thing I'm going to talk about in this chapter is kind of the extremes of intelligence. And if you go back and you look at the bell curve that is in your book, again, the extremes are essentially the 2% of the population at either end. So at the very left end of that bell curve, you have intellectual disability. If you hear people talk about developmental disability or mental retardation, essentially the same thing. Uh, generally defined as an IQ of about 70 or below. And these are people who are going to have a lot of difficulty just coping with age-appropriate tasks. So depending on the degree of disability, some people will eventually be able to hold a job, they can live independently, get married, uh, run a household maybe with some minimal assistance. They are never going to be high IQ, but they are going to be uh, sort of more more functional members of society. Somebody with a much, much lower IQ uh, may never learn to read, uh, may have difficulty learning to speak. At the really low levels may have difficulty dressing themselves or difficulty with things like bladder and bowel control. That's someone who obviously is not going to be living independently as an adult. And Intellectual disability can be caused by a range of things. Uh, a lot of people have heard of Down syndrome, which is a chromosomal disorder. Number one cause of retardation is actually prenatal alcohol exposure. Uh, and then there are others as well, brain damage, um, severe malnutrition, exposure to lead, all sorts of stuff. At the other end of the bell curve, we have uh, intellectually gifted, so usually defined as an IQ of about 130 or higher. And these are people who, you know, everyone has the stereotype that they're going to be all maladjusted and have no social skills, and that part is not true. Most people who are gifted actually have very good social skills, um, but What's going to distinguish them here is, I mean, Spearman would say that they have higher G. Uh, Sternberg would say that they generally have very high analytical intelligence. So these are kids and adults who can learn new stuff very, very quickly. They ha generally have a very good memory. They're very good at taking different pieces of information and seeing how they fit together. So a lot of times why these kids seem maladjusted is because they're bored out of their skulls in school, and they're around other kids that they have nothing in common with. But if you put them in a situation where they're with other kids who are just as bright as they are, all that supposed maladjustment goes away. You know, and the analogy here is if you took an eight-year-old and put him in a room with a bunch of two-year-olds and then said, oh, he's maladjusted, he doesn't play like the other kids, well, of course not. He's way beyond those other kids. So it's the same thing here. Um, but this is a big challenge because gifted education is not mandated by federal law. Federal law says the gifted education would be nice, but there's no funding for it. There is no consequence if schools don't have it. So that's the end of uh, my lecture on this chapter. You should be proud that you finished all the way to the end. And since I want to see who did watch all the way to the end, if you email me and tell me that you watched all the way to the end of these videos, I will give you five points extra credit uh, toward the class. So that's it. I hope you have a wonderful day, and I look forward to seeing you when I return to class.